Hello everyone and welcome back to Bitwise Day 28 um, where we create a complete software hardware stack for a simple computer from scratch. Um, last stream, last scheduled stream uh, was canceled due to personal obligations uh, dealing with my visa stuff here in Thailand um, and I've actually been pretty busy with other personal things since then so I uh, haven't really had a chance to work on the assembler since last time although I did check in some fixes for uh, compiler issues that people reported. Um, and so as a result, I'm just going to, um, to jump right in where we left off. And uh, I have a bunch of changes in mind, so I do know where we, uh, we want to get started and, and continue from last time. Um, <clears throat> so if you recall, um, we got to the point last time where we have sort of the start of the, the parser. And notably, one thing we spent some time agonizing over was exactly how to represent um, different ways, d different kinds of, I guess, keywords versus name data, like uh, distinguishing, um, you know, an instruction versus a register name versus just say a label or something like that. And um, one thing that I've thought about since last time is that um, our decision, excuse me, just said breakfast, <laughs> our decision to, um, to distinguish those kinds of entities at the lexical level um, was a design flaw, or at least I, I think so. Um, and so one thing I want to do now is to um, to unroll a little bit of the work we did uh, with with a what I think is a better design in mind. So that um, basically what we had ended up doing is rather than having the traditional intern versus symbol split, we just had sort of a symbol table full. Uh, we just had a symbol table, and the lex were directly mapped. Um, from let's see here, the lex are directly mapped. Um, is it stir to or stir range to sim? Uh, the lex are directly mapped from the string buffer that it parsed to the right kind of symbol, and, and then also figures out the right auxiliary data to go along with it. Um, and that was just kind of done in the heat of the moment uh, without a whole lot of forethought. And now with uh, with a bit of more thought, um, I think this is the the wrong thing to do. Although I think you could probably make this work, I think um, given that we want to support things like local labels and other kinds of local scoping, uh, I really don't think you want to do this at the lexical level. Um, you could potentially have a symbol table that kind of mutates, uh, kind of parallel to the lexer, but I, I think that separating this a little bit more, the way we actually did it in the ION compiler is probably the way to go. So now what I plan to do is to have only a single token type um, which is just a name, the same way we've we've had it in the past. And then if we want to recognize, for example, a register versus an instruction versus a macro versus, I don't know, a hard-coded keyword, um, we're going to do that in the parser by looking up uh, in, in a symbol table or some other auxiliary data structure what kind of thing it denotes in that context rather than trying to cram that into the lexer. So in hindsight, that's probably should have been uh, always done that way. Um, and so uh, I think what we're going to return to is essentially um, something like this, where we, um, this thing just canonicalizes string data and um, this stuff goes away. And we're sort of back to where we were in terms of, uh, of all of that. Um, let's see, what's the... Some of these names have to change in a separate way as well. Uh, So yeah, let's remove this from now. 
Um, I'm sure, that broke a bunch of stuff. Right, so not stir to whatever. This is just going to be stir in turn. This is going to return. Um, what it always returned to say, kind of a canonical char pointer for that thing. Other than that, I think the rest of this is broadly the same. <clears throat> Excuse me. Does this look good? I guess it does. Right, and then this has to be its stir and new intern stir. Something like that. <clears throat> I'm sure if we run that, um, right, so now it doesn't recognize at the lexical level the distinction, which is how I want it, actually. Um, and then the way I want to do this instead is, um, I guess, like, parse, what's an example? Parse instruction, I guess, um, rather than, you know, for something like this, I basically, I guess I want to do something along these lines. Um, uh, match token, uh, token name. And, um, and then based on the name, we do some sort of lookup uh, to make that distinction. Um, I think probably the other thing we want to do is I don't think I really want to have sort of a fully decoupled parser. I think we just want to have an assembler because there, we're not going to have this kind of uh, really tight um, split or a really decoupled split. Um, I mean, it might still be useful to have a function called parser error just to communicate that it's a parsing specific thing. Um, okay, let's do more of this with um, For this, it would be something like this. what we should have something called yeah we already have the parse name what am i talking about so we have parse name um just remove this crap to be honest Now that I think about it, um, I don't want to have a decoupled lexer either. I don't really see the value. Um, let's just make that um, fully integrated. That was a, a false kind of generality that's not really valuable here. Oh, we should remove the case. The case sensitive matching. Um, so I'm just going to do this and then uh, we're going to do something along these lines. Um, I mean, I guess we can just for now Don't want the case. 
this is weird. Like I'm so used to case retentive replacement where it matches any case, but it retains the case. Like if the thing you're replacing has an initial capital L, it will preserve capital A or whatever. Um, but anyway, as usual, Visual Studio is garbage when it comes to text editing. Um, Let's just scope that. Well, to be honest, we could still call this Lex test. We'll just call it from here. Apparently it didn't match the braces. Um, match, matched, okay. No fields. Unresolved type name. Did I really make this replacement? This must have been a manual replacement. Init assembler. I guess I did. It's definitely one ass too many. I think this also means any dot lexer, if we if we have any uh, dot asm, that should just be. Um, See. I think we just remove this uh, parser error. Should then be as an error. All right, let's uh, set some breakpoints. See what's going on here. Um, all right, looks reasonable. I guess parse line now, parse line now doesn't do much of anything. So let's do something about that. So yeah, my my plan is now that, um, for example, in something like parse line. Um, Oh, actually, I remember one other lexer change I made after the stream that should be mentioned. Um, when I emit a new line token, which I believe I do, yeah, the way I emit new line tokens is a little bit odd. I changed it now so that basically any time it skips any consecutive uh, range of white space, excuse me, uh, any time I skip a bunch of white space, it checks whether there's a new line anywhere in there, and then at the end of that chunk, it emits a single token, new line token, if there is one there. And so the idea is that essentially, rather than getting a bunch of new line tokens, uh, if, if you have a bunch of line breaks, really you want to have this kind of canonicalized new line that acts a little, you know, that acts a lot like a semicolon uh, statement terminator or something like that. Um, and so that's really the idea is that. Um, you know, if there is a new line, we want to emit one. Otherwise, we just grab the next token. But um, but this way, it's kind of agnostic with respect to the surrounding white space around the new line, whether the consecutive new lines have white space between them and so on. It just checks, has there been a white space in this chunk of, of 
has there been a new line in this range of white space? And if so, we emit a new line token. Um, and so this lets us use, this, use it in the parser as a kind of clean terminator token, basically. Um, so for example, you could do, you know, you could do something like this uh, and it would behave well in terms of, you know, are there intermingled comments or multiple new lines or whatever. Um, but anyway, yeah, so now what I want to do is um, rather than just putting that stuff in the in the lexing, uh, we want to make that distinction at this level using this uh, interned name in a hash table. And so this is where I want to have a symbol table, but it's going to be separate from the other stuff. Um, and so I think what we're going to do is, let's see here. Um, I'm just going to, I'm going to have a general arena just for random crap. Um, so I'm just going to put this in here. And uh, I think what you want, let's just, let's remove all the stuff that's sort of partially orphaned at this point. Um, and then we'll re-implement it once we have the scaffolding set up to support it. Um, so basically I want to have, Let's put this sort of at the top of the assembler related stuff. Even though we can support out of order declarations, I think it's still nice to uh, to partition things, uh, order things in a reasonable way, since this is kind of the most important data structure, I suppose. So, um, so yeah, right, right, right. So I, so this should also be removed. That's legacy. Um, I think this should be, well, let's actually, let's leave that for now. Um, although I do think we want to make it signed since this is a primarily 32 bit oriented assembler, at least for now, one nice trick you can do is to use a signed 64 bit value, which can losslessly represent either a signed or an unsigned 32 bit value. Um, without any weird issues. Anyways, um, let me just scan over this to see if, if there's anything else that's sort of legacy from the old stuff. All right, yeah, so I think what we want to have is we want to have a simple table and um, one, um, this might also be a good opportunity to demonstrate a different way of using tag unions um which is um conceptually the same as any other tagged union well maybe we don't want to use it here um for now let's just uh do something maybe i'll show it let's see um But anyway, um, so what kind of things do we have? We have an X reg. So this is roughly what we had before, but now it sort of has a different, um, it, it exists at a different level. Um, so X reg um, instruction. And I think instruction should just be like a pointer you know, to like an instruction definition or something like that. I don't even know what you want to call this. Um, like an instruction definition. Maybe I'll just call it an instruction. Let's call it a definition because it's not really like an instance of an instruction. Um, so like, well, I guess we can, I guess we can put the name in the sim as a whole rather than the instruction def. But um, well, let's put it here too. I think that's reasonable. Um, so there's an instruction kind, uh, which is going to be like, you know, like reg reg or reg m or jump or branch i mean th this is a good place to start um 
I can't remember what the terminology is. Like they have a specific terminology for the different instruction classes and I should probably try to follow them. Uh, so they have what they call op, which I think is the normal, yeah, this is not the most descriptive. But by reg reg, I basically mean, I mean, I guess I could call it reg reg reg. You probably should. To be really descriptive. Maybe that now. Maybe I'll just call them like that for now. Uh, so that's the kind of instruction. And so, you know, for example, add x1, x2, x3. And this would be like add i, x1, x2, 1, 2, 3. Uh, or something like that. And um, let's remove the name for now. And then for the data. I guess now we should have an opcode. I think that's where this thing lives, right? So right, we want to have this kind of deal. Um, so instruction kind. I think that's actually enough for now. Um, So get sim um, because you need a map, then you can say map get. Maybe for now, this is really all you want. Um, of course, you could have a helper function. And you say, you know, you do some distinction here, like um, if this is an instruction, then you, you know, assemble instruction. Um,
All right. Um, and then I think you also want to say something like uh, def instruction. I think you want to say this should be null. Um, because you're defining it for the first time. And um, it's a really kind of what you want to do, I suppose. We can just make this a value field now that I think about it. Um, let's see. Allocate out of the arena something of size sim. And then you put that in the map. And you well, don't even have to return it, I suppose. Just make this self contained, it seems reasonable. Yeah, we have to fill in these fields. So there's a name, there's a kind, there's an op. Right, so the kind here is that, and then here we do data um, instruction. Um, command, command. Oh, oh. Now we have a way to define um, Find an instruction. I think for now we're just going to have an instruction table. Um, I think it might be better maybe to make this self-contained. Because then this can be, you know, like add, um, drag, Add something like this.
This has to be interned. So we take this instruction template, intern the name, make sure there's nothing under that entry, create a new symbol, um, and fill in the data, and then put it in. And then if we now parse it, Do something like this, just to make sure everything is coming through. What does it say here? Oh yeah, don't need that anymore. Um, All right, so it's not finding something there. Let's see what's going on. So we are getting a name, it looks like. Oh, right, we have to actually um, this stuff should probably be brought. Hmm. A little bit out of this section of code. Well, Um, okay, so it found that instruction. Um, let's just fill in all of them while we're here. As well as we can, anyway. Probably some of these are their own special class of thing. Um, load upper immediate. Um, so this is something that takes a destination register. I mean, maybe I'll just call it load or upper in something like that. Um,
yeah, Visual Studio has some really weird stuff about indenting nested brace uh, initializers in some cases, where I don't know why it thinks this shouldn't be indented. Like when I you see when I press uh, the open brace, it left aligns it for unknown reasons. JAL. Um, I mean, I think a bunch of these are probably their own class. Let's see, JAL is jump and link. Um, and so it's like JAL X1. Um, this, you have a destination register, and then you have an immediate, right? And JALR is like have a register. Probably these should just be their own their own type to be honest. So we need upper M and we probably just need like specific classes. Let's try that. And these, which we're just going to call them loads. Um, So I think that's basically all of the um, all of those guys um, for fence. 
trying to remember. Yeah, fence is a special class. It has those success. It, 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 you specify like a set of memory barrier type things. Um, so there's a set of flags. Um, so we should give it a, its own class. This is kind of like what do you call it? Nullary maybe. Uh, no arguments. E call and e break. We don't support them in our emulator right now, but let me just remind myself of what the arguments are. Okay, so they actually don't have arguments, um, or rather, it's part of the API, which are registers or implicit arguments for this. So these are nullary as well. Or C is our read write, and I will call these C is our reg. Read and clear. Okay, so what do we have to add? Nullary, or nullary, I actually don't know how to pronounce that correctly. Um, nullary, CSR reg, CSR M. Oh, and load and store. And fence. Then assembler should be okay. so we're already doing this. And presumably the reason this is happening is because there is a duplicate name somewhere. Well, and we should be able to see what that is. Add. So add appears twice. Yeah. Because I think it's there, and then it's also later. Because one was our initial test case, and then the others were from the table. All right. So now that we have these, um, we can, based on the instruction kind when we're parsing, we can actually do stuff. Um, parse instruction um, sim well and I guess maybe I should really say like instruction data That'll work okay um, because then we can do a switch here and we can say like if if you have one of these guys, which is you know the standard, I suppose, um, you will do like um, match token as an comma um, You know, something like that. And I think then we want, and for now I'm not going to sort of use the value, but uh, we're going to expect an immediate. Um, Just set up for now here. All 
Right, so we don't have parse x reg. So that's the other piece we need to do. Um, Um, what I'm actually going to do is change this a little bit. So for um, the sim kind, I'm going to have a default thing which starts out as none, so that the first time, a little bit like interning, the first time you refer to something, it gets added to the symbol table and has an identity, but it's not filled in yet. And that's how we're going to handle forward references to labels. Um, so we might as well do that right now. And so the first time you try to refer to something, it actually adds an entry on demand. Um, that's just kind of how it goes. And maybe that's actually, you know, get sim is probably um, add sim. Okay. So let's see what we do here. We intern it, make sure it doesn't already exist. Um, we allocate an entry, we fill it in. Well, that should be fine. Um, all right. Invalid type expected. All right. Um, parse sim. Shadow definition. Not more control paths, return a value. Let's just say return zero for now. Okay. Um, let's just make sure the old stuff still works. And now if we have some garbage, it should not um yeah, it should say expected instruction, but um you can see this thing doesn't give a null null pointer dref error the way it did the first time when we had to catch that. So, all right. Um, okay, xreg. So I think we're going to have some other things along these lines. Um, def instruction, def regs. I mean, for now, I'm just going to sort of do it the barehanded way. Um, this could be more table driven in the future if we wanted it to be, but for now I just want to have the data structures that can eventually be data driven, but I don't necessarily want to be kind of driven, necessarily driven by an external file or whatever, although in the future we'll want to do that, I think. Um, and so, right, you do basically the same thing we did before, I think. So you fill in, you fill in a name, 
And so X32 is four characters if you include the null terminator. And then you want to add that. Um, you want to add a symbol. Um, and hook that up. And then parse xrec. Um, if sim kind is not uh, sim xrec. Um, got the token kind info. What is token info? What's that called? Okay. Got comma. Oh, right, because, let's see. So at this point, let's see, we've parsed the leading name, the leading symbol, and now we pass this in. And based on the kind of instruction, we then parse all this stuff here. And this should not be a match, this would be expect. All right, let's see what's going on. So the locals, let's see, asm, the current token is four. Unfortunately, the way we're doing enums makes it harder to see the enum names in the debugger. One, two, three, four. Oh, wait, zero, one, two, three, four, yeah, duh. X1, oh, right. We are not currently. The, the way we're reporting the error is actually incorrect. We should be saying that we're not, not even sim name or not token info, just this. That's why I was confused. It was complaining about the next token, not the token that actually caused the error. Um, so for example, if we now do like well, I guess there's different things. Here we would complain about expecting a name, right? But if it if it is a name, but it's uh, a name that, for example, maybe it's foo. Let's say it expected an X reg got foo, right? Um, okay. Now that we have um, done this stuff, we can actually um, we can actually emit some instructions. And um, I guess a little bit of background is in order. Um, the kind of assembler we're going to be starting with will only work with a single section, but there's no reason to not anticipate a little bit what will happen later. So normally, if you look at an executable file or you know some binary image, that's intended to be loaded by the operating system um, or, or you know, by a, a primitive bootloader or something like that. Um, you, you, it's typically constituted by one or more sections. And a section represents a contiguous buffer of memory 
which is represented on disk either explicitly or implicitly. And I say implicitly because in some cases uh, you have the zero initialized uh, segment uh, where you don't have to actually specify the contents because it's ex implicitly zero initialized. But nevertheless, there's a range of memory that is going to be loaded. Um, and uh, typically you have separate sections for different kinds of data, like the zero initialized, uh, implicitly zero initialized data is probably the big one, but typically you also have the text segment, AKA the code segment where the uh, actual instructions live, and then you have a data segment. And those can be loaded in separate, well, they can be loaded at separate offsets. There's no, they don't have to be, they're kind of independent. Um, but typically when you're loading them, um, you have to make sure that any instructions that or any references between the segments are properly fixed up so that um, you have referential integrity. So if there's an instruction that refers to, a, if there's an instruction in the code segment or aka the text segment that refers to a piece of a global variable in a data segment, uh, the loader has to make sure that um, if things get relocated and in, in, inevitably they're going to be relocated because typically the data is assembled assuming it's loaded at address zero which is basically never going to happen but in any case um, the loader is responsible for doing fix-ups and relocations and stuff like that now for us we're not going to be doing that in the beginning but it's probably still useful to have a notion of a section which encapsulates a memory range to wh wh where you can target when you're assembling uh, and so if you're assembling instructions you're targeting the text segment if you're assembling global variables you're targeting either the data segment or the bss segment so or section i should say so um this is uh i think a useful a useful concept a useful thing to have uh represented explicitly i think and so i'm going to it's going to be a named uh a named segment and there's going to be a buff and this is going to be a stretchy buffer, I think. Yeah, I guess we'll make this a stretchy buffer. Um, maybe we'll just do a realloc ourselves or whatever. But anyway, um, and so I'm going to call this the code segment or the code section, sorry. Um, and it's going to be here. Um, and there's probably also going to be like a current, let's call it a section, which points to the current section. So typically what happens in an assembler is you can say like dot, dot text or dot data, and it will switch the current section you're targeting. And so this would involve just switching this pointer. Um, so you can even do something like this, but I'm not gonna. Uh, actually, I'm just going to just do it like this for now. Um, and this is right, 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 right. Um, and so to get started, um, when you're doing something like this, say that um, you can actually do what is it called encode instruction I think it's called encode instruction and um, if we look at our So I guess that's one thing. We want basically equivalence of this sort of thing we had here for the dynamic assembler. Oh, right. The other thing we want for the section is you want to have a current address. Just, just you know, where you're currently emitting stuff. Um, some of that stuff down here and so I'm 
Yeah, I guess it's broadly the same thing. Um, one difference from the way we were doing things here in the old or the, or the, the, the dynamic assembler we did is that um, we essentially pre-allocated the buffer and if we ever float it, we just printed an error. Uh, that's not what we're going to do here. Uh, so we're going to do something similar, I guess. And you know what? Let's not even... Let me just inline this. I think that's premature. Um, so it's going to be the same basic thing, but the difference is, let's see, if this is greater than the size, then we're going to grow the buffer basically. Um, and rather than using a stretchy buffer, I'm just going to do a realloc. And so it's just going to be realloc as in buff um, to, I don't know, uh, I guess. Uh, I guess, let's see here. Min, min size should be, um, something like that, right? This is the remaining space. Oh, sorry. This is the remaining space in the buffer. Um, no, wait. Size. Doesn't make sense. This. Sorry. Not sure why I was confusing myself doing that. So it has to be at least large enough to accommodate that. Um, Then otherwise we do the same thing we did before, but now we dynamically grow the buffer as required. Um, and then here we will encode the instruction. And this is where I have to see what we did. Well, I guess actually we can carry over almost all of this stuff verbatim, so we might as well. Um, Also makes me realize that we should just use that. And then um, that was my phone ringing as a reg op. So I guess this should be reg. Asm reg up. Asm. 
up. And then RDR is one, R is two, something like that. <laughs> That's not right either. Um, so one thing you could do at this point is you could do some emulation. Um, okay, so parse file, parse line, um, let's say parse lines, which is basically just going to be while asm token, um, parse line asm. So about as simple as it gets. That means it's going to parse all of them. Okay, well, I guess that wouldn't really have any useful side effects. So let's do the immediate, um, the immediate version as well. Which is fortunately not very different. Um, token all. I guess for this case, this is where probably having the all thing is not ideal. Um, I'm going to make it an L long and just call it val. Um, well, now let's make uh, parse uh, parse immediate, and for now we'll just return this directly. Let's see, it's a data val expect token token int. And later, this will also be the constant expression parser will be involved in here. But um, this is parse immediate. And then So yeah, that's something we should do here. Um,
Okay. Um, so let's, I guess, do, do something more interesting, like, um, Okay, well, that didn't seem to work. So this should just have loaded really the immediate one, two, three, but let's see why it didn't work. Let's do the the parsing. So immediate looks like the right value. Um, what is the third argument? So what do we say here? Asm m op asm. So this thing here, the op should be the right thing. Rd rs1 and then immediate. So we specify those values, two registers, and then immediate. And then we encode the instruction, and it should be add i. It's one, two, three, that should be easy peasy. Um, and then here, let's see if it does the growth correctly. So currently there should be a null buffer. And now there should be a not null buffer, but we forgot to update the buffer size. Clearly, that was at least one of the issues, I would assume. Um, so we do, yeah, double the old one. I'm going for this. Okay, so now it worked. I think that was just the issue. Um, so that handles the very basic stuff. Um, let's, even as basic as this is, let's actually add labels now um, so that when we try to deal with the more fancier, I mean, because the rest of it we've already kind of done, right? Like we know how to handle from the dynamic assembler, we know how to handle the different instruction types at the superficial level. Um, but we need to handle these operands that are labels in order to do things in a nice human readable way. And so I'm more interested in getting that up. Um, I think we've been going for an hour and 20 minutes. And so um, maybe I will go 40 minutes at least for the mainstream just to, to get some basic label stuff working. Um, so we already have a lot of it since we, we have the symbol table set up to support that kind of thing now. Um, so the way we're going to do things, as I've mentioned in previous videos, is that we're going to be using a multi-pass approach. And so just to give you an idea of what that entails, let's take a, uh, a case of doing branching um, where you have a forward reference to a label. So for example, um, and then, you know, some stuff after. 
and I'll call this A, and I'll call this B. Um, in assembly code, this basically turns into this. Um, something like this. In that, uh, I covered this before as well, but uh, you skip if the negation of the condition for the body is true. And so, hence, this this will fall through if the condition is true. Um, but if the condition is false, it will skip directly. But the point is, at this point, you don't know where, uh, you don't know how far ahead skip is. And in fact, if you're processing things linearly, at this point, this name has not even been defined. So the, f the very first occurrence, and assume there's no scoping for labels for now, but the, then the very first occurrence of this label, or any really this name at all, um, I mean, here I'm writing it sort of in pseudocode rather than actual assembly. In assembly, it would be like, I don't know, it would be, you know, BEQ, there would be some branch and compare thing, compare and branch rather. Um, but the point is, there would be some label reference, and it would be the first time you've seen it. Um, in a multipass assembler, the way you handle that typically is that um, in the first pass, you... Um, like if you if you look at all the stuff we're doing here, so there's two ways you can do it. You can do pass one purely as a dry pass or a dry run where you're not really emitting anything, um, or you can just do two passes and they're kind of idempotent in the sense that or not quite idempotent. They're idempotent for stuff that's already been resolved. So if you have a backward reference in the second pass, it's essentially going to be handled the same. But in the but in the first pass, if you have a forward reference, so it hasn't seen the location of that label yet, it's just going to use a dummy value like zero for its location. And then in the second pass, it's going to repeat, but now the symbol table has been filled in. And um, as a result, um, those will actually resolve to a reasonable value in the second pass. But anyway, um, that's one way of handling it. And I think that's probably what we'll do. Uh, so we already showed backpatching, which is kind of dependency driven, uh, but here we're going to show multipass. So we're basically just going to parse everything twice. Um, and in the second pass, we should also make sure if we want to be nice that, um, you know, any reference labels are actually defined. Uh, so in the second pass, if uh, you refer to a label and it hasn't been defined, that's actually an error. It should be defined in the second pass. Otherwise it's an error, but, um, but that's the idea. Um, so for now, let's just handle labels, assuming everything is a backward reference. So any label we see has already been defined. And, and then it will be a small change from that to handling forward references with multipass, which should be hopefully. Um, so probably the most basic thing is um, we want to be able to parse labels. And that will work by let's see in front of any line um, you can optionally like you parse a symbol if uh, if this thing matches a uh, if following this is a colon, then we actually define a, uh, a label. Um, and so um, Again, we're, for, for multi-pass, we have to allow for things to be redefined again in the second pass, uh, sort of benignly. But here, we're going to check um, if we're defining a label, then uh, we don't we do this. Um, and then we want to say, you know, like def label or something. Actually, and, and what we're just going to do is uh, for sim label, uh, there's going to be like an address associated with it, right? Um, And so we're going to say um, the kind is a label, and we just grab the address 
at this point associated with the label. Um, but then there's going to be one or more labels in succession. I mean, there's no good reason to have probably multiple labels denoting the same thing, but we might as well support it. Um, and so we actually have a loop where we can match zero or more labels uh, and then f eventually an instruction. And um, we may end up changing, changing the way this grammar works once we add directives and other things. Like maybe a label should be sort of a, a thing on its own rather than a prefix, but um, let's just do it like this for now. Um, and actually, let me make this a fatal error. Um, we're going to use uh, long jump and jump uh, set jump to recover rather than using exit. Um, but for now, I just want to do this so I don't have to constantly handle that. Uh, okay, so there is no token colon right now, I suppose. So we have to add that. Um, and now, um, I guess let's do loads. I'm trying to remember what case we handled over here. I mean, we could either handle load stores or we could handle branches, but let's do load stores. So, um, Um, so if there is a load, I think the syntax we're going to use is something like this. Um, I don't particularly like this, to be honest, but it seems to be, it's what gas uses. Maybe we'll change from it. I honestly hate this to be honest, to be honest. The, especially the fact that the the offset is base, the immediate offset is first, and then there's a paren, and then you'll say like foo, and this means you know the location of foo plus zero bytes is what you're going to be loading. Not really a fan, to be honest. Um, Let's just say, let, let's not even do the offset. Let's just say there's we handle this basic case first. Um, so then you parse, uh, you parse, first parse the destination register, and then uh, you really want to parse. What should we call this? I mean, you could just say parse sim, sure. Um, if sim kind is not equal to sim label. Expected label. Um, uh, 
guess we should copy over some of these other helpers. Add some AUIPC. Um, RD. Well, I guess it's not zero, so it's the high offset. So it's like offset equals asm adder minus. No, it's the other way around. It's um, sim data adder adder minus sim adder. So if this is ahead of the stream, it's going to be plus four, for example. So this is the offset. Uh, and this is where we want the in low in high stuff. Um, so, oh no, sorry, this is the in high. And then you have the actual. All right, um, we also need some directives to help us uh, define data. So we want to be able to write something like, um, I don't know, counter one, two, or value uh, one, two, three, something like this. Um, maybe I'll just use it without a dot. Um, I mean, I don't know, maybe this is a command, this is data. Maybe I'll call this a command. Um,
Um, let's try to. Okay, so let's let's leave that where it is, and then let's try to load into X2 val. See how that goes. Okay, that actually worked. You see X2, it's, the offset is eight. That seems like it, uh, that, I guess that's, oh yeah, no, the eight is the compensation for the, is that right? Shouldn't it be minus eight? Um, but anyway, um, so if I move this, in any case it works, if I move this afterwards, um, it would no longer work because it would say expected a label and, we, and it wasn't defined as a label at that point. Um, But now we're going to make it sort of multi-pass, and um, if it's sim none, then we're going to upgrade it to a label, the first reference. But it's kind of going to be an undefined label, I guess. Um, So it can be in one of two states. It can be a label or it can be none. And if it's none, it becomes a label. Um, and I'm going to use a dummy value of minus one, which is going to be all ones, just as a sentinel. Um, you should probably use a flag to define it. Um, but let's just use that for now. Um, Or actually, let's just make it zero. Let's not even, for now, let's not even do validation. Let's just fill it in with something. So in this case, um, oh, right. Um, right, but OK. be either of the two, I guess. So yeah, this is going to load something at location zero, essentially, um, which is going to be like the, this is actually the value of the first instruction, which is this add instruction. Um, so that's really all we're seeing here. It should be a consistent value, um, namely, the you know the, the decimal value of that first in, add i instruction um, because it's not filled in at this point. But now let's try doing multipass. Um, and f let's just do it manually, sort of barehanded at first. Um, So let's say the, the basic initialization doesn't actually do all the cursor setup. Um, and so then what we're going to have 
is asm stir is asm input, uh, asm line start is asm stir, asm line is one. We're going to do all of that stuff here. Um, I mean, I guess you can you can do it like that. So this should just be the same stuff for now. Okay, that doesn't do jack shit now for some reason. Because of this. Right. Um, so now let us, again, let's do it barehanded first. Let's just do another pass. Oh, and I should say that init pass should also set the address back to zero. Um, let me just see if there's other stuff I'm forgetting about. So the buffer we're not going to reset. Um, but the address we are, all this stuff that's kind of cursor state, I guess. Like the stir, line, line start, the token. The interns will survive. All this other persistent stuff is there. This one gets reset. Yay. Does that make sense? So now, even though... The data is defined afterwards. In the first pass, essentially, it just treats it as zero. In the second pass, it's been defined, and we actually know its location. And I think that is almost enough to, uh, to stop the mainstream. So, so let me just recap this, like why it works. In the first pass as we're parsing these instructions, this LW load word thing, when it sees val, that label has not yet been defined. So it just uses a value of zero as a, as a filler. Um, so the first assembling of this instruction is actually not really loading from the right location. It's just loading from zero. Um, but then when we get to this point, this label actually gets defined to point to this memory location, which I guess would be address 12, since it's the third four byte uh, thing. Um, and then in the second pass, uh, the symbol table is, is now filled in, um, but we reset everything else. So all the buffer data gets rewritten, everything gets reparsed from the start. But now magically val is actually filled in as if we know the future basically, but really it's just from having already done it once before. Um, and that's the basic idea behind multipass. So I wanted to, to just show labels with multipass in its ba most basic form before uh, shutting the stream for the mainstream. Uh, and I guess maybe I won't do an extra stream today. I have to go run errands. But um, this, you know, doing branches now is the same thing, just using branch instructions, but same idea. Everything we did with the dynamic assembler is now uh, done this way. Um, and you can see it's quite a bit simpler. We don't have to do all the fancy um, reference tracking and back patching and so on. We just literally, because kind of what we were doing, if you look at how we were doing label fixups um, in Resolve SimRef, we were basically re-encoding the instructions that had unresolved references um, uh, once we finally resolved those references. And um, which was effectively, it was selectively re-encoding those instructions that were uh, not fully resolved at the point where we first saw them. Uh, with multipass, essentially what you do is you don't, rather than having this sort of distinguishing being instructions that can be assembled completely right now versus things that have to be resolved a little bit later when we finally resolve their operands, we can just do everything twice. And in order to make this work, you just have to make sure that 
things are repeatable in the right way, like the parser should be resettable and repeatable, for example. And of course, there's various things you could do, like if you wanted to, you could save the tokenization effort for the second time around, but honestly, that stuff is not probably not worth it. Um, so you can literally just reset the, the full parsing and just do another pass. Um, so that's the idea. Let's see if there's any questions. Yeah, sorry, I wasn't looking at chat because I was trying to stay focused today to, to catch up on stuff. Um, so yeah, Sanitas was earlier asking, I was curious about the sections earlier, this, the explanation makes sense. I guess we'll start out with a flat model and at some point as the hardware OS gets more advanced, we'll need sections. Um, yeah, exactly. Like uh, the a, a case where you typically have only one section would be something like a bootloader. I don't know if you've ever worked with kind of raw metal uh, embedded devices or, or bootloaders and desktop operating systems. But if you're trying to uh, compile a C program or really uh, prepare any kind of code uh, for a bootloader, for example, typically that's just a single section. And it's usually quite small because the boot sector uh, unless you're chain loading, in which case it can be a little bit bigger. But typically the stage one bootloader, for example, would always be a single section, even in a modern computer, just because it's uh, by its nature, you're dealing with the the simplest part of the entire chain where, you know, at that point, actually, it's not totally true. I think UEFI actually has, has support for multiple sections because UEFI is so totally over-engineered. But like, for example, the old uh, PC style boot sector where you have a 256 byte I guess it's 256 or 512 byte uh, boot sector on on old IBM compatible PCs. Uh, that's an example of a single section binary image. Um, and so, yeah, uh, th that flat model is, even in modern cases, is sometimes useful when you're bootstrapping. Um, and if you're not, um, even for more complicated things where you're not just bootstrapping, um, if you don't like there's a lot of embedded devices that don't really dynamically create processes and load load programs from from you know from a static state to an in-memory state uh, where it's just always loaded from the beginning and that's another case where just having a flat image makes sense um, in that case one case where you sometimes do want to have multiple sections is in order to control the memory layout like for example uh, maybe some section maybe the different ranges of ram are actually disjoint so that in order to use all the RAM, you have to target different memory ranges. And that's the case where even on a simple device without a real loader, you might still want to have, um, you might still want to have disjoint sections, even on a simple embedded device or something like that. Um, boom, 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 boom. Someone was asking about how many assemblers I've made. I mean, I, I don't know. I've made a couple, um, but most of them have been sort of specific, like they've been for a specific purpose. They haven't been designed to be like, you know, something you like. Most of them, for example, have been kind of runtime assemblers uh, that are that serve as the back ends of compilers or other code generators rather than kind of human targeted programming tools. So I don't know, maybe four or five, depending on how you count, something like that. But none of them are going to be as featureful as what we will end up writing. But this is just uh, the beginning, of course. All right. Um, yeah, I think that was a good stopping point. We managed to do multi-pass in a very simple form, admittedly, uh, with loading. Um, and if you understood what we did back for the uh, dynamic assembler, um, you can probably extrapolate quite easily how we would handle all the different cases using multipass. It's actually simpler than when, what we were doing before. Uh, although, you know, the downside is we need to do all this kind of scaffolding to get here. But once we're actually at the point where we're actually assembling stuff, multipass is simpler because you're literally just doing everything twice. So um, that's it for today. Um, we will be back next stream with um, basically, I guess it will kind of be a little bit easy from that point because we'll just have to fill in everything and we'll see how much of the filling in of the, of the different instructions I'll have done by then, but uh, otherwise we'll continue from there. So uh, thanks for tuning in and I'll see everyone next time.